Soju, someone was saying in chat, Soju uh, is not on this list, but was one of the players that had an early elimination. I think he got day two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. So definitely not a bad performance, but I, I think. Wow. Gangly didn't even consider him no, no, a notable no, exit. Don't, don't do that. Soju. Damn. Someone clip it. Someone clip it. Soju, you're not even relevant enough to be on the You Died Early. When? Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Don't Talk If You Don't Know, the unofficial official podcast dedicated to all things high-level teamfight tactics in the Americas. This is episode 46, a review of the first Tacticians Cup for set 11. It's going to be weird. We don't have names for them anymore. Just going to be like Cup 1, 2, 3, etc. Uh, I am your host. It is me, Frodan. <laughs> I have dyed my hair and uh, put on some weight, and I look older, but it is me, Frodan. I am joined by my co-host today for the first time ever on the pod. I am so excited. Gangly, how are you I'm good. Uh, this is uh, an exciting moment. I was I was kind of on a little bit after Summit, but this is the first time ever at, ever being on like uh, in a capacity where I feel like I, I get a chance to speak. And I do just want to say... It's a good opener, but I think you have to work on the cadence. Frodan has this, you know, this yeah. don't talk if you don't know the unofficial official. There's a there's an artistry to the way Frodan introduces the podcast. You've got some time while he's oh. on vacation to work on that. I don't know. Do, you think, do you think I was like looking forward to trying to fake host this podcast? All anyone's going to do is compare me to Dan. I'm not trying to get compared to Dan. Fuck that. <laughs> but there's no other option. Uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Dan is getting ready to have a kid, uh, and so he's off for the week and for a little while, and we wish him and, and his wife, Taylor, nothing but the best. We hope it's all smooth and awesome, and we can't wait to meet them. Um, so Dan is taking his first ever episode off. This is We are 46 episodes in. Dan has never missed one. I've missed a bunch. Damn. I'm a flake. Dan is all fucking over this. <laughs> uh, Philip, fresh off of the win at the first Tacticians Cup. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Jangly, didn't we do a DTI YDK before? I think this is my second DTI. YDK no, we did Hyrule Radio. You were on no. my podcast, bro. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was last week, but but we did Noxus Cup with uh, X Niyamo after. No, that wasn't me. I don't. That... You were for sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't think you were I did that one. Because Bryce was gone. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I. Did. I'm like not even sure this... about this one. This is a really bad look for me if I'm wrong. But like, uh... no, 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 this is good chat. Someone go to the tape. No... Keep going with the intro. Someone go to YouTube. <laughs> was Gangly there or not? He because doesn't coming know. into oh, this, I was there, like, damn, I've done two DTI it is there. with Gangly. Wait, wow, what? Hockey confirms. Yinwei confirms. Oh, <laughs> I just looked oh, it up. Fr- okay. <laughs> It's I on. remember this. I was so so. Okay, the reason I don't remember is because I was traveling and I was like, I remember I was on my laptop. I had my AirPods in. I was like half sick. I, it was all kind of a blur. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This, this, guy, this guy. Oh, and I think it. I'm. This guy completely forgot. A podcast. Yeah. Okay. I'm kind of a fraud uh, on that. Oh, my bad. Okay. So, but Philip, how, how you doing? How does it feel to be coming off the win? I'm doing good. Uh, it feels a. Uh... It feels good. It was a little bit like anticlimactic, I think, because I went like sixth in my last game. Um, mm-hmm. but uh, it's like I feel like that sort of like made it like it never. I never really got the like, oh, I went first, like I won fog fog. It's like, oh, I took like my good sixth. Um, but yeah, very very exciting. Uh, very you know grateful. Okay, well, uh, I guess that's kind of how it goes, right? Like some TFT tournaments aren't gonna finish in a super hype way. Like sometimes. You're just happy the other guy went seventh, right? <laughs> so, well, we're, we're really happy for you. Congrats on the win. We'll get into it a little bit more as we get going. But, Pocky, we got to bring you in here. I feel like you've been mm-hmm. on a bunch lately. I feel like we didn't have you for a little bit, but you've been back a few times. You've been doing well uh, competitively. Mm-hmm. How's it going, Pocky? I'm doing well. I had a drink before coming on. Excellent. So feeling good. That's great. Yeah, you got mm-hmm. three. Uh... I mean, I'm not too surprised. I'm doing well in the first tournament. I've had a track record of first tournament easy. Oh, say say more about that. I, I Nick, he's, he's I know I, your, I your thunder like I literally I I, I sent a message to Rice and I was like I have a whole doc you know we we worked on the run of show I'm like all these talking <laughs> points you can say anything but I have one talking point about Pocky that I want to bring up on the show. Pocky <laughs> brings it up in the first <laughs> the first thing Pocky first thing he says. Okay, so Pocky for people who don't know, can you fill them in? How how good have you been in opening tournaments? Uh, set five, I won. Set six, I placed first as well, but it was shared with four players. Uh, set seven, I think I mm-hmm. top eight it. Uh, set eight, I didn't play. Set nine was bad. 
<laughs> set 10, top 8. Or, well, it was second place behind Malala, and then top 8 again. Damn. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, it's like what we were talking about before in the pre-show, but it's just like, I do think I learned. I don't think I learned in the initial phase fast, but like once things somewhat build up and then there's a little bit more established meta, I can figure out ways to uh, kind of find edges over other players because honestly, like most players on NA, they, they're they kind of sheep. Yeah, it almost feels like, <laughs> um, like would, you, would you say it's fair that you may not be like the first person, but you're like the first optimizer. It's almost like, yeah, I think a lot of people do think of you as the innovator because they think of like the scale score and guide or they think of like the the three cost uh, like assassin stuff back in like the old days of TFT. But what you're describing right now, I think sounds a little bit more like once someone figures out how to get the first 80 percent, you're the first person to go from 80 to 95. And that's like what gives you the edge. Do you feel like that's that's an accurate way of describing it? Yeah. Like, for example, the scale score thing, it's not like I've came up with the comp i came up with a way to play the comp right with like picking up cloak first carousel and whatnot and all that stuff and like optimizing that line but it's not like i came up with the comp i see these kind of stuff that like people do play i see places where they could play better and which is why like historically i've always paid attention to a lot of one tricks like <laughs> I've watched a lot of Aqua games just to watch how Aqua <laughs> is doing. Aqua's probably watched more often than anyone. <laughs> but it's like between like all those players, like for me, like a lot of people know me in the previous sets, like when Sins were still around as the Sin player. But that's really just because I watched the one tricks and just optimized it better than them. And then that's true. And like I, I played Katarina before Raiditz had that as his claim to fame to, to an extent, right? Like all these things I like, I find early and then try to optimize it further than like most of the server. Okay. And Philip, how would you describe your play style? Oh, I think I'm one of the sheep that Bucky's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I just like, um, I have, like, some sense of the game, and then I talk to a lot of people who are, like, very good at the game, and I just sort of try to, like, steal as much tech or, and, like, knowledge from them as I can, and then, like, steal as much knowledge and tech from, like, streams as I can, and just try to, like, apply all of that to, like, um, find, like, the, the highest EV line from, like, any given spot. What is your current yeah. study group, Philip? Uh, right now, it's, like, uh, Weijin, Malala, uh, Toronto, Tokyo, and then, like, Salary Minhe. Uh, there's a bunch of people, like, Clear uh emily wang i mean Pock's uh, we did like a review right? Pock? no uh, no, we don't... i'm not no no, no. Oh, i, I mean, thought like, pocky's all every... over that's what i've heard yeah i thought i thought pocky was like had a foot in yeah. every study group uh, kind of it's like we did a study session because basically like after day one of tactician cup i think every group basically lost like half of their members i think so we lost we ended ours. up <laughs> yeah, like, or, we had, like, there's, like, there's also like Bosso skills um and like Dark Snub also studies with us but like yeah I mean everybody just died except for me and Malala day mm -hmm. one so like T Lights took us in and we, nah. we ran like the, the reason I bring that up though and I don't know Bryce if you like have any insight on this but when I actually think of Philip's study group most of the people he listed I I think are the players that people have a hard time nailing down how to describe them as players like when you think of Bosso, Minhi, even Malala, like this guy had the most, the winningest set in the history of TFT. And at the end of it, even he was like, you ask him, what do I, what do you do better that, than anyone else? He's like, I, I'm not really sure. Maybe I just don't play bad. Like even Weijin, I think to some degree, people may have a hard time like putting him in a box. And it feels like kind of a study group wide trait that they just are solid players. Yeah, I think for me it was because I remember I got asked this on my first "Don't talk if you don't know," and I didn't really know how to like respond. I like it, to me the idea of having like a strong like play style is sort of weird because like you know like patches change, like sets change, units change, whatever. Um, and like so for me like I don't I don't really 
I, I think I would be like worse at the game if I was just like, oh, I'm good at like reroll or like, oh, I'm good at like four costs or whatever. And I don't think like any top player or like most top players aren't actually like in a box like that, even though like I think sometimes people like like to paint the storyline like that. Um, but like, yeah, I think for like me and I, I think also for like Wajin and Malala, it's sort of just like you do like whatever ways you games, you know, like it, that's all that yeah. matters. So I think that that's a really interesting thread to pull on because I think it's I think it's exactly the point that Gangly's making too. It's just it's weirdly in the kind of the confidence in the way you frame it. Like when Malala's like, I just try not to make mistakes. It, he's like, it, he makes it sound so easy. But really, when I think about like what makes Weijin and Malala special, and the the thread there that that whole study group it feels like is pulling on yourself included, Philip, and what you're talking about and how you're describing your play, is like go into a game of TFT with no bias. Every like most of the best players go in with some meaningful amount of bias, Pocky included, right? Like Pocky for sure takes leans in certain metas. Like there's he's optimized three cost reroll in like basically every single set, right? Um, there's a, like a bias towards that type of play. Setsuko always biases towards econ traits, fast eight, fast nine. He literally doesn't care mm -hmm. what the patch is. Yeah. He's always biasing in that way. Like dish soap, I think started to pull on the a little bit as well. I do think that it's fair to describe Discope as having some bias towards four costs. I think that just stylistically, that's the the heart of his play. Although I do think he's quite a capable reroller, so I don't want to paint a picture like he's not. Um, but I think that's what's so cool about like the Malala and Weijin and Philip and your whole group is like it seems like everyone's questing after that. It's a cool way to approach TFT uh, and theoretically optimal. It's hard to argue with no unbiased TFT, like really genuinely trying to decide how to play each and every game just based on what's going to give you the highest EV. Okay. Uh, we should move on to the, uh, to the patch because otherwise we're never going to get through this thing. Um, so uh, there was a patch today. Who played? How much did you guys play? I played again. games. I, I took a first. I didn't, I didn't see any new artifacts, no new support items. Just fast ten, and uh, yeah, so I took we, my first so, and went went to play Valorant. I, I think I played two games. I have games no games. Play? No, Three well, games when, when Bryce us. is the most uh, <laughs> experienced on the patch, it is a problem. Yeah, I mean, so I, I watched a, a bunch of games. I don't know if that counts. Uh, yeah, I've been watching yeah. a lot. Okay, okay. So, what, what's your lot. perceptions of the patch? Uh, from what I can tell, the main difference for the patch is like Heavenly is a lot less. Uh, uh, simpler to play, okay. and then Duelist is playable. And a few like reroll lines are like kind of playable now. Like Bard seems to be playable if you have like certain items. Sure, yeah, certain I think, corn uh, items in particular. I think three costs seem like a uh, kind of strong, especially if everybody is opting into these like uh, it's opting into like the four two lottery and like contesting each other. You know, like. You end up just drinking stage four on like a two star three cost a lot. So, what are the three costs that you think are viable right now? Uh, I mean, like, I think a loot is strong, bard is strong, and like duelist can be strong, right? Uh, I don't know if I you're think... supposed to like reroll all those lines, but I, I think they're they all seem sort of like stable in the machine. Sure, sure. Even even if you don't reroll them on level seven, you're still playing around three costs and you're tempoing way different from the mm -hmm. lobby. You roll some yeah. in the mid game. Mm -hmm. I think to an extent, uh, there's a lot there's certain conditions for some of these lines but uh duelist seems pretty good with like plus one like regardless okay. and you don't even really need to reroll. and then like a seems to be good at the stats but i can't really tell I, i've been hearing like mixed opinions on a so yeah far. there's been a lot of twitter discussion on a like waterpark mm -hmm. was saying he thinks that plus one is a bait that like if you look at the data it's not that good you can't itemize the um, the umbral spat holder efficiently mm -hmm. like you want to itemize the set one you want to itemize the Alun, you want to itemize the silas so like how are you also itemizing an umbral spat holder in that line i guess that makes sense although i have to imagine it makes you way more stable until you find a set you yeah. like is this guy just hitting a set on on eight every time because <laughs> because if so i'm sure that line's really good then. when you talk about <laughs> the three cost stuff being conditional on plus one there's something I, I haven't actually thought about this too much, but I'm thinking about it now as, as you're bringing it up. I like the idea, big picture, that like reroll should be good under certain conditions. That that makes sense. That's like a good statement. I really dislike the idea of reroll being conditional under getting a plus one. To me, that feels like uh, 
such a narrow condition that you should not be hoping for. Like, to me, it feels like, you know, shouldn't having five of, I don't know, any given three cost by four one mean like you should just always reroll from this spot, even if you don't have the plus one. And I feel like if, if duelists, for instance, are only playable under plus one, I don't exactly know like how viable Bard is, but like before it, you know, when Bard was good, you definitely didn't need any sort of plus one, but the, the unit itself was just broken and that and that wasn't okay. I just, I feel like there's some invisible middle ground that we haven't really seen this set where three costs are not necessarily forcible, but also don't need very strict conditions to reroll. And I don't really know what the answer is, but I, I know that I don't like the idea of it needing plus one to be rerolled. Uh so in my opinion the issue really stems from augments but like we're not ever getting rid of augments from what it sounds like so uh i think it's always going to be somewhat conditional or it's going to be op it's it's kind of like it kind of has to be conditional with the fact that augments exist because if it's not then and if it's playable anytime and then you have to augments the line's just going to be broken when you have to augment and then everyone's going to complain about it. Yeah, it's amazing how much augments shifted what like theoretically balanced TFT looks like, right? Because that yeah. that interaction you're talking about three costs affects a ton of the game and the way in which metas shape up. Because they can't, they like it's just too frustrating to, if the if you get if you high roll your augments and the lines becomes busted, like it's just a bad bad experience. Yeah, it's like the only way to fix it while keeping augments is making all the augments very generic. Yeah, but at that point, there it's like goes against the whole reason they have augments. Quick aside, Pocky, I know when so, when augments first were released, you if I remember correctly, you really didn't like them, right? Okay, I you still, still don't. don't. That yeah, that's I the question. Don't. You're so you are still you're still largely <laughs> negative on augments, even with like the, uh, you know, uh, quality of life changes with the additional re rolls and things like that. Yeah, it's better for sure. Like I mean, it doesn't help that like every set they decide they're gonna add some new augments, and then lo and behold, <laughs> like half the new augments they add are being disabled or whatnot. <laughs> it's it's, like, it's probably like, not what? half. I mean, I'm, I'm down to give him some grief, too, but it's definitely not half. Yeah, okay. I'm exaggerating. But it's, like, definitely the case that, like, augments are very hard to... It added to the complexity of balancing the game. It did. Uh -huh. And as a result, uh, we've had much more unbalanced metas. But they, they do a good job with, with it. And I don't really complain because it's, like, fun in some ways, regardless. Like, there are some combinations of augments that are just like yeah i'm chilling i don't have to do anything yep for sure uh okay i think we should i think we should move on because i think mm -hmm. we want to talk about meta a little bit more later but there's another layer of the patch these new artifacts there are so many new <laughs> artifacts uh I, I listened to dish soap earlier like when he started his stream and he was like why is everyone complaining about artifacts like only one of them seems to be meaningfully out of line. Isn't that pretty good? <laughs> like, you know, it's not like you can force it. It's like they they were they were smart. They disabled trash treasure, and they you know it's not easy to like get the broken combinations or get like the individual. Um, so what do you guys what do you guys think? Like mission accomplished, shows promise. Like you hate this. Where are we at? I'm down. For I think for me. It's a little bit, I don't, maybe this is like a boring answer, but like, I, like, I was fine with the way it was before, because like, okay. I, like, I thought it was like easier to balance. Oh, I think this might be like hard for them to balance, which is like the, the main reason that I, I would be like against it. Um, and like, uh, yeah, because I feel like a lot of, uh, I don't, I like, I, I don't, I'm not sure, but I thought a lot of the artifacts sort of read as like, um, sort of like a, a narrow application where like, it sounds like it's going to be terrible breaking on like two or three units. So if like, the artifact is strong and those units are strong if you hit that it's just like a 1.0 combination but the rest of the time you're never clicking it um which like yeah i don't think it's super fun um but uh yeah i mean i think it's cool they're still trying to add new stuff to the game yeah i, I for what's worth i i really agree with that because a lot of a lot of the effects on the artifacts are what i would describe as gimmicky right like unique interactions that we've never seen in tft before anytime you do that it's either going to be completely unclickable like just it's just the effect is bad 
um, and you have to like crazy stat it up in order to justify picking it. But then it's like, what's the point? Because it's not the identity of the item anymore. Like the whole point was this unique effect. Or it's just like niche combinations that are stupid broken. And I think that it's because there's so many of them now, there was an element of um, a portable forge related augment, like portable forge specifically, which is the most common one, obviously, because it's gold that you would like, okay, there's not that many things to choose from. I know I'm going to get like probably one of this or this, but now you can't do that anymore. So unless these are really overtuned, I'm pretty sure people are going to skip them, which means we're only going to see these in the game off of like random stuff like fortune and encounters. And I really, I already feel like I don't like my encounter swing games too much. So this makes me really scared. Well, the funny thing is, if you check the stats, Portable Forge has become the most clicked on. Well, yeah, <laughs> sure. it's it's new. It's yeah, of new. course, because everyone's trying it out. That that no. doesn't say anything. Like, like wait yeah. a, a month. Even I, I like are. completely agree yeah. with you guys. I, I hadn't even considered that. But yeah, just by pure volume of, of you know, uh, options that are coming out of this fort, it, it makes it much harder to want to play, especially because they are going to be more nuanced and situational items, but because the percentage chance of getting any one specific item in the condition that you want that item, it, it makes it feel really bad when you take it and, and just miss. Personally, I'm just like, I don't want to do it more homework, man. This is like, there's so many new items. Like, there's so much other stuff to read every time a new set comes out. I'm getting so tired of it. Like, I want a little bit to just stay the same. So personally, personally, I'm not a huge fan of it, but uh, we have to read it all through like the hyper roll anyway. So I need to do my homework at, at some point. Dude. Oh yeah. I think to be fair, it's probably not uh, like a change that's supposed to be made to, for like uh like more competitive or like higher ELO players. I, I'd imagine this is something they're putting in the game so that like uh, more casual players can like have fun and like uh, have like more like unique experiences. Um, so I think it's like sort of hard to like judge like the success from uh, this point of view, you know? Yeah, I think I think artifacts are fun. Like in general, I think people like like have do having an item that does a weird thing in a game of TFT is cool. So giving a bunch more of that type of stuff in the game can lead to a lot of other fun and wacky moments, which is li- clearly a core tenet of TFT. Cursed Blade doesn't actually mm-hmm. drop star level like it used to, right? It's not it's not that Cursed Blade, right? Okay, no, okay. It's not. the I set one. So. I thought it was supposed to when they disabled oh, wait, it. it is. Uh, I think they they. Yeah, I think it, it's supposed to do that, but it's like disabled because it's like. Uh, yeah, they actually brought back yeah, the set yeah. one item. Like that's so crazy. Yeah, I think that that is yeah. like the intended. Where is a uh, hush mm-hmm. and uh, what was the other one? No, 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 no. There's no, another no. like and, uh, thing. I forgot it's called. Yeah, but it disarmed yeah. you. Yeah, the, the sword breaker. Yeah, or something. Oh yeah, sword breaker. That sounds breaker. right. Yeah, bring all those yeah, back. Right. I want my uh, my Olaf cleaving the entire team with triple hush. Man, this was before this is before they understood like on, the, on hit too. So it was just, there was like trait that you know, what was the trait? Gunslingers, Gunslingers whatever that yep. like, Yeah, red buff, sword breaker, sword breaker, illusion, and then their their team never attacks. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Yeah, well, OG TFT was Crazy too fun, stuff. man. We would hate um, it now, but it was too fun at the time. We yeah. would hate it now, yeah, 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 for sure. Even the nostalgia kick would be fun, though. I'd be down for play it for like a day. Okay, so let, let's move on to the cup. This is... Before we get into the people who did well. Yeah, I was just going to say, we're going to start off with the... Not the people who advanced far into the, the event, but instead the early, the early eliminations. And let me just say, it was a bloodbath. We had... So many ranked players fall extremely early in the event. I think, I mean, the most the most egregious placement here that I think would shock literally everyone watching the play the, the this podcast has to be Wajin Iverson at one hundred thirteenth. I don't think anybody would have seen this coming. This is certainly the worst placement we've seen from Wajin since his rise in North America. But it, it wasn't just him, right? This was. What, what is this number that I have here? This is nine different players all falling be- before this final day. I, I, this was a shocking result for the first event that we had since uh, becoming the Americas. I mean, Spencer, Milk, and Robin are all very close, right? But like, yeah, below that, it was it was ugly. Does anyone wonder what happened with Weijin? What the fuck happened? I didn't. I literally didn't think this was possible. I think like uh, got kind of unlucky. I from you know like uh. Turn his messages and like our like uh, Discord. It was sort of like uh like not even Faker could make it out. Scenario okay. doesn't seem very happy okay. about his games. Does he does he think he played bad too? Uh yeah, I think it's like a combination. I, I think yeah. like in when you when you place like this, it's always sort of like a combination, right? Yeah. Um and it's hard to play your best TFT at the end when you've been getting kicked in the teeth all day. 
yeah yeah i mean i i thought too again like uh that like because like again i studied with the wage and everything in toronto tokyo and i thought they were both like uh way better than me so i assumed they both just got like oh interesting beat. okay Con- yeah i feel like toronto tokyo is he's one of those players that like we have seen him do well but he's never been consistently at the top and so for personally it, it's really hard for me to get a read on him because he's also i don't think he does he stream even like i've i don't think i've ever seen him play outside of when he's competing in a cup he's definitely a player that no he doesn't stream. yeah he's hard to get a, a read on it would you say that his form going into this event is what you would expect from him for a standard cup better or or worse yeah i mean i think toronto tokyo and Legion were both like uh top five on ladder going in um so i think it's like a very surprising result yeah yeah pocky were those the most surprising eliminations for you as well or who were you surprised about uh yeah it's probably those two because they're just like especially toronto was really doing well on ladder like Wajians had a little bit of a rougher set compared to usual from what i can tell but like toronto was like smurfing on ladder prior to the tournament so it was really surprising to see them go out although i was like kind of relieved because competition's easier now <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that works out in tft right where like the person who places 121st in the event is actually just like a significantly stronger threat the players who do move on are so grateful that that player hit that that level of variance i also did want to call out soju someone was just saying in chat soju uh is not on this list but was one of the players that had an early elimination i think he got day two yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. so definitely not a bad performance but i i think wow Gangly didn't even consider him no, no, a notable no, exit. Don't, don't do that. Soju, Damn. someone clip it. Someone clip it. Soju, you're not even relevant enough to be on the you died early When list, is bro. the last time that we had a tournament that Soju, I mean, Spencer and Milk are both players that have been in and out, but like Soju, Spencer, Milk, Robin, Kurum, Weijin, Re-Replay, like all of these players not making top 32 is insane. And granted, it's a much larger field, but like... Even with the larger field, it is shocking to me how many mainstays in TFT just got, I mean, they just fell a little bit short, some of them, and some of them actually just got rocked. But it was a really, really surprising result for a lot of the the figureheads of NA. It feels like, yeah. the I, I don't, this is just feeling, it feels like the most I can remember, especially on day one, big names going out. Uh, yeah, especially the the four, like, that are, like, from the last placement, right? Those are like the most surprising. I think yeah. Riri not making it is like not the most surprising considering he was like on vacation yeah. for like until like the week before. So he had like very little time to prep. And you said Riri well, I just was think slow in prep. I think Riri was actually in pretty good form um, as well for what it's worth. Um, I know like uh, we actually brought him in bef- uh, to prep before day six because T-Lights um, was convinced he was like the like one of the best early game players on the patch um mm-hmm. and like wanted wanted his opinion on a lot oh, of wait spots. didn't so didn't like, uh... t lides didn't everyone say t lides was the best early game player yeah 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 so like so T-Lides he, is like he, an he early was, game he, piece and he was he was asking like a uh, spondo for like help you know huh. um or like re for help so uh yeah that's interesting i don't know i like vouch for him a little bit interesting um okay well let's look at the people who did well at the event uh, so this is our top 16 graphic. I mean, look, I mean, we covered it a little bit already, but I feel like we have to go back to it. If we're going to be talking about the top 16, Philip, we have the champion on. Uh, you were a full humble king in the interview uh, that we did immediately after. Um, do you want to pop off a little bit? You won a tournament. It's kind of cool. Uh, I still feel pretty humble. I don't know. Um, Like, I mean... Yay. I, I feel like I didn't really play, like, perfect TFT on the last day, and I felt like there were, like, a lot of people who I thought were playing, like, really good TFT, so, like, I don't I don't really feel like I have, like, the, like, uh, the right to say, like, oh, everyone else's shit, I'm a beast, you know? Um, I'm pretty yeah, sure you do have that right, because you won. No asterisk on the scoreboard of life, Philip, but we can't make you do it if you don't want to. <laughs> yeah, everyone else is trash. I'm a beast. There we go. The Let's you, get it. Here's the thing, like... <laughs> I, I know um, P- Philip kind of caught a little bit of heat after we, we published uh, the hyper roll with his career AVP of like 4.7. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to have an ego after that, you know. But <laughs> but here's the thing. I think people 
really have not been giving Phillip credit. And he has had it coming for a little bit. One of the things I, I've been saying is that this guy's had a, albeit slow, but steady improvement in his performances since set seven. And this is a guy that was getting weekend one at every event in set seven, <laughs> which is where like those, those, those that, that bad career AVP stems from. And since then mm-hmm. has kind of slowly crept up to improving his placement set nine. He has, was a third place finish at the Noxus cup makes it to the regional finals for the first time. We don't talk about day two of regional finals. It doesn't matter. And then all of a sudden, he's like a, a second weekend mainstay in set 10, doesn't get too far, but does solid. And now set 11 comes around, and Phillip's placement in the four tournaments he's entered, right? Fortune favors, you got 10th, Ascension of the Ages, you got 5th, uh, Tactician's Trials, you were the third overall point scorer on the weekend, Tactician's Cup, you win the whole thing. And to me, it's like, and we can talk about it later, I guess, when we talk about ballots. But what I think Philip has brought this set is that even if you don't believe that Philip is the most skilled or maybe the most knowledgeable, he is a performer. He has he has actually showed up to every single event that he's competed in and has not left the points on the table that have been there for him. I think that not every player can do that. So I think we should absolutely be giving Philip way more credit than he's asking for himself. Fill up. Nope. You just need all you do is you just see gangly around, bro. He can talk. Your shit. He can talk your shit for you. He's way better at this than you are. <laughs> I, I guess for me, I mean, like, I guess some context I'll give is like, I, I like even thinking about like day six. I felt like I like lost a lot of placements, even in games I was like pretty happy with. So like, I mean, that was like on my mind, even like going into the last game where it's like, oh, if I like mess this up, it's because I threw like five placements earlier in the day. Um, and also like, okay, it, it's it's kind of easy to be humble. When your study group is like Wage and Ivory and Malala, you know, like you can't really like. I'm I'm pretty sure like I I wanted pump and I'm still not even like top three in terms of achievements, um because like Toronto Tokyo went to Worlds too, so like uh yeah I mean like I'll I'll stop being humble when like I feel like I deserve it, which will hopefully be uh soon. I love it. That's uh very level headed of you, and I think probably best for your ultimate TFT trajectory because if you thought you were the best right now then you probably would never achieve whatever your peak is going to be. So uh, keep after it. I'm excited to see you keep going. Um, yeah. Honestly, coming into the Tactician's Cup, I was like afraid of Philip, looking at how he's doing, until the scrims. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but then, but then it's like, it seems like when, it, when the tournament actually came, he, he played really well. I, I figured out what it was, actually. So I had Philip on high roll radio, and I, I was talking him up a little bit. And after, as soon as the show ended, Philip is like, Gangly, you have to stop hyping me up. Because every <laughs> single time that you do, I get round one in Vegas. And I have, like, the worst performing score in the regional finals in day two. Like, you have to stop talking about me. So what happened was the hype that I brought at high roll radio translated to him going... 88878 eight, eight, in scrims, but he he it wore mm. off by the time the tournament started. I was so at, yeah, I was actually hella depressed after scrims, but then um I asked the I asked Ripple Overdrive because uh Ripple had some really bad scrim scores and then popped off uh some like a uh, cup last set I remembered. Um, so I asked Ripple if he was like trying, and he's like, oh yeah, I think I was just like tired, and then I like learned everything not to do, and I think it actually worked. Like I think I actually did learn everything not to do. Um, because I just thought about like everything I did in scrims and just didn't do any of that. Um, so yeah, honestly, that's <laughs> legit. There's like real, there's real value in that. You test stuff mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, not gonna do that in tournament. <laughs> and in many ways, it's actually the better way to use scrims. If you're just if you're mm-hmm. just sweating playing the lines you already know how to play and know and playing them exactly you know how to play them, you'll never actually improve. Um. Okay. Well, let's talk about some other names on this list. Dish soap comes in at number three. This guy's on a little bit of a roll, wins regionals. He was pretty good at Worlds. Obviously, it did not work out the way he wanted to in the end, but he, he looked good at Worlds. Uh, comes back out swinging, taking third in this cup, and was right there at the finish. And he also notably came on right afterwards for his interview and was like, I am motivated as hell, and I'll be oh. back. I got another. He was the, it was the opposite of Philip. Philip was like, I don't know. We'll see. And Dish Soap was like, I'll be doing the next interview. I'll see you guys next next cup. Oh, that's uh, I didn't I didn't know that. That's which, awesome. 
that's kind of scary too. He's he's literally never done that. I've I've watched a lot of this guy's TFT. He has never once popped off like that. So I don't know. It, the PP might be be in for a challenge Malala kind of set. We'll see. It's it's funny that you know even in set ten people were talking about Dish Soap as obviously he's in the big three. Everybody respects him so much as as a player, but he did have the weakest of the three. Uh, in in, uh, in terms yep. of tournament results, they had the weakest results of the Setsuko Weijin Dish Soap Big Three when we, when that was a conversation, and then he ends the set like you said, winning the regional finals. And I think people are starting to like kind of turn their heads, and it's like, wait, no, he's like he's he's turned a corner now, like he's starting to pull up. And now top three, especially when you see Weijin getting day one, Setsuko just on the outside of the top sixteen, Dish Soap's really making a case for himself to kind of do like the Setsuko run that we saw in you know sets eight and nine. It would be pretty sick to see another one of those top three members start to have like a really consistent set. I think there's an argument he's worth the most in fantasy drafts right now. I like going into the tournament, there were only two people I knew I was gonna have my team. I knew I was gonna have pocket, I knew I was gonna have dish soap, and I was just gonna pay whatever it took to get him. Um which admittedly, and this we can segue yeah. to Pocky, because I'm curious about where you kind of evaluate yourself heading into this. I say that, Pocky, but at the end of the day, I really mean that with Dish Soap. I would have bid basically whatever money because no, I don't think anyone's going to bid me there. I, you're the Part of the reason I knew I was going to wind up with you on my team is because I knew I'd be able to get you cheaper. I felt like you were a Tier 1 player that I could get at like a Tier 2 price. Did you think you were a Tier 1 player going to the event? Like, Do you think you were on the same tier and should have cost the same amount in a fantasy draft as like Dish Soap, Setsuko, Weijin? Mm, my ego's not that big okay. to say that, but... <laughs> okay. I'd say, like, coming into the tournament, I was, like, quite confident that, uh, like, between the stuff that, like, Sox was peddling to the server and, like, just the general way to, like, play the patch, I I felt like I had a better grasp of it than the server, most of the server. Okay. So, wait, you're saying Sox was peddling tech that you thought was good that you incorporated or that was you felt like he was heading in the wrong direction. So you knew no. what edge. Socks knew what to do. Got the other people who tried copying didn't know what to do. Makes sense. Uh-huh. That's kind of like all, Sox... That's actually always been Socks' MO a little bit. It's <laughs> yeah. like if you could just play like True. Socks. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could just play like Socks, man. It's like kind of like trying to copy Setsuko. It's like good fucking luck. <laughs> Are you referring yeah. to anything in particular? Like I know there was the Silas tech that people were talking about. Is Is that what you're referring to? Or is there something else? I mean, it, it is like a general like AP slam AP items into playing towards like a uh, more of a fast nine line that kind of centers around finding a Silas to begin with. But I think a lot of people just kind of saw it as this is a level eight comp or something. I, I don't know exactly know. People are just so, like so. Basically, he's abusing Silas being broken in stage four, early stage five. Like it's a it's the efficient way that gets you to play around the ap legendaries which are strong if you can get there yes exactly and silas is clearly still strong in those stages too okay so he doesn't he doesn't get like outscaled he, you basically get to mm-hmm. then build a board around him that scales into the late game yeah and philip did you play much of this line in the tournament mm, i played a few games uh i definitely wasn't piloting it at like as high of a level as i should um but like uh I felt like I learned more, like, the, the more games I played of it. And, like, yeah, I agree with, like, what Pocky is saying, is I feel like a lot of the servers sort of had, like, the wrong read on the comp where, like, they were just, like, um, you know, rolling, like, sacking into it, rolling to zero at eight, like, saying yep. eight to look to dig for, like, Silas two, you know, instead of pushing, stuff like that. Yep. Basically, just don't understand the tempo of the line. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a very, like, tempo-oriented line, because, like, the, the whole point is it's sort of, like, you play these, like, cheap uncontested units ideally and then you you swap out for like you know you're like recon twos your uh okay. way twos yeah Makes Hockey, sense. i wanted to um, follow up on something bryce brought up earlier when bryce is talking about you being like a tier one player at a tier two price in fantasy this is something i think a lot of people have talked about prime pocky or peak pocky is is one of those players that we want on the world stage um I'm curious to know, because it, it feels like when you're in form, you are always making final day. Even I think, like, the, obviously, you know, there's there's variants. There are times when you're not. But I, I, I kind of want to hear it from you. Like, can you feel it? Like, do you know 
going into events like this that you are one of the best players? I know you're saying before, like, you don't you don't want to have an ego like that. But even you can still be humble and recognize, like, I'm in form because you've top aided too many events for it not to be something that it should be recognized. Yeah, I mean, to an extent, it's like I go in with like, I try to be as like objective and like not biased as possible because I feel like that's like the most important mentality to have for TFT. But I think uh, when I put in the time like effectively and I have like the right mentality going into a tournament, I'm always confident. Like, I I won't, like, go around parading it on, like, any, like, social media or anything. But personally, I was, like, really confident going into this. It's just, can I, like, continue that for the whole set? And in particular, the main thing that's, like, been haunting me recently is, like, regionals performances. Yeah. Has been, like, not that great. Like, it's been a while since I've been in date. The final day. Why? Also. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Uh, I don't exactly know. Like maybe it's just circumstantial because honestly, I haven't. I didn't play set six regionals because I started playing Lost Ark, and then like set eight, I skipped. And then set nine, I did just did so badly. So like, there's actually not even that much sample size to work with. It's like set seven, set ten, I did poorly in regionals. So it, it it really could just be like not that much sample size. But I, it is possible that it's like my skill sets as a player end up not being as uh good near the end of the set. But personally, like, I don't want to like stay that way. So I've been, like, really trying to, like, like, it's like, I, when Rain was on DT, IYDK, the last one, and she was, like, talking about, like, what I am as a player, or what she thinks of me as a player, I was like, I kind of agree, but it's, like, something I'm trying to uh, evolve mm. from, basically. Okay. Makes sense. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my mentality about it. Before we move on, or unless you didn't want to move on, I feel like I, I want to call out a couple other players that made top 16. Just like a two two minute thing. Because oh, yeah, there's sure. a lot of players here. I think there's a bunch of people we want to I'm not okay. I'm not anywhere near ready to move on. We've got we got 45 minutes left, right? I was gonna I was gonna do JD next. I think JD is a really good person to to talk about. I think so for me, when I was doing my ballot, the framework that I that I kind of used was looking at players with like this like performance index of like who's actually performing in set eleven, who has showed up with like the very limited sample size. And for me, it was like if I'm going to put Philip on my ballot, I actually have to put JD. There's no you you cannot sure. put Philip and not JD because. And I don't mean this is a slight to Philip, but ev- pretty much everything that Philip had done, JD had done slightly better. This guy top forward three events before the Tacticians Cup and then showed up and placed top four here. JD is one of those players that like, <laughs> it's funny because I think people have thought of him as like this fringe top player for a very long time. And he hasn't actually shown up in a consistent capacity, but he's been a player that kind of like waltzes into regional finals, like every set somehow. And just, we don't, we still don't really give him his flowers. Um, but this time around, I mean, JD's making a lot of noise in North America, and it, it's really cool to see him with such a tight performance, really close, only two points down to actually closing it out. So, you know, props to JD. Hey, he, he was within six of the overall point leader for the tournament, right? So um, he was he performed consistently well mm-hmm. throughout, and then obviously in the lead-up to it as well, like the mm-hmm. qualification. Uh, anyone here study with JD a material amount? Uh, not really, but he is involved heavily like t lates and like that group is like heavily involved so i've been like i've been chatting with them a bit more often since i've been studying yeah i did uh oh i i did water view with uh jd um it's actually like uh it's funny i like uh day day four water view group ended up being me yeah it was super it was super random you guys yeah it's, it's me pocky jd t lights cambuli and uh, malala and everybody actually made top 16 um uh, yeah which that's i feel like sick, sick. What what um, what was it like to study with him for the first time? Like, what did you notice about the way he thinks about the game? JD, um, oh, he's like, 
<laughs> it's like he, he makes like such good he, he makes very good decisions while like not caring, you know? He is just like he's just like, oh who cares? Let me just like swap and like the, the positioning ends up being perfect and like he's like, who cares? Let's just like 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 he plays very well, but he's just like he's so like chill about it, you know? I don't know. Uh like he, he's not he's not stressed at all. Um but yeah, I mean I, I think he's hella good. That's I think awesome. I remember him it like basically ignoring one of the person's feedback and just be like, ah, nah, I'm just going to force Kane. <laughs> <laughs> Was he right, though? I mean, I would do the same thing. So. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Sounds right to me. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, JD, look, there's a bunch of people on this list. I, one of my, this the sad, one of the trade-offs of where I'm at in life right now is I can't watch as much as I used to be able to, especially I... I used to be able to watch a lot of the up and coming players, and it was always fun for me to like see. Like, I haven't really studied JD. I haven't really studied Philip, and I want to watch you guys play because I love studying new TFT. But if I'm being honest, it's just like I don't get to watch that much, so it's it's more efficient. Almost, it's like okay, if I if I only get to watch a little bit, it needs to be fucking dish soap, right? Like I like I need to know that I'm getting a lot of really high value time. Um, but I hope I get time back soon because there's there's so many up and comers that I think have very legitimate cases, like watching the start that philip and jd are having there's a decent chance one of you guys actually continues this all the way through and just puts together like a really good set and i i'd love to watch i, I want to make sure i get a chance to watch some of it but it's tough um but yeah it's cool i, I J, you're right jd is a player that has not gotten his flowers gang like he really hasn't um and he's been here often enough that he that he ought to have by now uh and also not all you guys stream and that makes it hard too like if you don't stream consistently, how do you how do you stay up to date? I will say I Philip and I were talking about this when we hopped in the call earlier. I've never really understood the whole like oh when I play on stream I don't I don't, I don't play well. I played in the tri state qualifier yesterday and I streamed that dude. Props to anyone who talks yeah, and so hard. chat while playing the game. I felt like I was operating at like ten percent mental capacity. But yeah, Bryce, we can we can move on. Next person. It is so hard. You're absolutely right. Uh, These guys are the guys that play at a high level and stream. It's, it's so impressive. You know what it is? You just have to have so much mastery of it that you you actually don't need as high of a percentage yeah, of your yeah. brain. We, yeah, Nick, you and I need way time way time too high of a percentage of our is. brain every game of TFT. I mean, uh, did, uh, did Philip stream for the tournament? No. Uh, my computer is not that good. I'm like, yeah, uh, I, I was worried I'd like turn it on and it would like explode in the middle of the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then like, yeah. So I don't, I, it was actually, I, I didn't have any VODs for any of the, the reviews I did. So I was like super useless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it just means you, it just means you were stealing tech exclusively. That's true. I love it. Yeah. I was just, just kind of surprised. Like, uh, like so little people streamed because for me, uh, for a tournament, I actually feel more comfortable when I'm screaming. Really? Interesting. Why? Or, or like it, it, it puts me at the correct like tension, like mental hmm. state for, because usually when I'm playing, I'm too relaxed, Oh, interesting. Which is why like, I, so like having a little bit of like that feeling of like people are watching me helps me play a little bit better. I feel like I probably performed a little bit better because I wasn't streaming. Um, Just in like, like when like I I miss like in like the game where I was like rolling fire early at three and I rolled past it once. I'm pretty sure if I was streaming, I would have had like a little bit more of a reaction. Oh, I'm pretty <laughs> yeah. sure like me in that moment, I just like completely like stone faced, like didn't didn't blink, just kept <laughs> rolling. Um, but like I I like I think if there's like a camera on you, you like have to do something, right? Also like if I, like I'm not sure, like who knows, but um, like maybe it helped a little. I don't know. Interesting, very interesting. Okay, uh, moving down the list. I don't think we can talk about him for that long unless anyone... All I got to say is I'm a Triple Eights fan for life. This guy just... All he does is play Woach lines. He's just... All he's doing is sitting there thinking about what would chat want me to play in this spot? And then he plays it. It's fucking beautiful. <laughs> uh, and, he, and he cooked. He cooked. He had some... He, he overcooked a little bit on, <laughs> at the very end, but there was some really nice nice chefery going on in the middle parts. I did not watch a single Triple Eights game. In fact, I've never watched a single Triple Eights game, but let me just say... I called it. I called it five sets ago. <laughs> there is a YouTube short of me saying five players to watch at the Zon Cup in set six, and Triple Eight is one of those players. Okay, but can we all agree that just call someone five no, sets ago? No, he's an up and comer. It's, he's an up and comer. He's an up, up, an up, 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 up and comer. Yeah, it's <laughs> actually the Inigo Strat. You, you mentioned everybody once, and then like yeah. you, you're like, oh, Sorry. I called it. 
Yeah, we call we called the Aniko strat. You, you you two are the fucking experts at this. I shit. I did. All right, low key <laughs> though. I did actually in 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 the primer video that I made with Pi Hat and DZ, I did put triple eight in there. This guy, I remember the reason I I put him in that video back in set six was because this guy had a really high win rate uh, on, on solo queue with like a relatively low game count, but was climbing really well. And in my mind, it's like, okay, well, if you're able to convert your high roll into first, and this is actually like, I think why, why Pocky has done so well in tournament traditionally is because when he high rolls, this guy's able to convert those in into top two finishes. So in my mind, it's like, okay, well, if this guy is on ladder, able to convert his high roll really well, then he probably will be able to do it, you know, every, every so often in tournament. And I saw the same thing in this set and he was climbing consistently well he was the i think fourth or he was top eight uh best performers in ta- tacticians trials like this guy did very well in the, the qualifier event and i think if you're going to give credence to players like philip or casper or Weijin who did really well in the trials as well then you have to give some credit to the players who maybe maybe not don't have as big of a name but are putting up similar results in those events so triple eights i think most people had never heard of him before before this event, but let's just make it clear. I called it. Okay, so <laughs> I just want to be really clear. I have to step into lawyer mode for a second. I, you would like credit for the fact that that five years ago, you mentioned him in a video in an unrelated tournament for an unrelated <laughs> set, and then recently you thought about including him <laughs> in a video... But then you didn't. Is that is that what yeah, you like credit for? Just so okay, okay. Is yeah, that, I am I asking for too much? Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Gangly gets credit. I agree. I agree. <laughs> oh man, that's too good. Uh, Socks. We talked about him a little bit. Um, Pocky, talk to us about this man. How is how does he do it? How is he still here? How the fuck did Socks make a top eight? He feels like he barely thinks about TFT. He's got two kids. How? I mean, he's busy, but I don't think he barely, like, I'm pretty, he, from what it sounds like, he wants to think about TFT. Sure. It's like, he really wants to be able to put time in TFT, but he, like, he's got responsibility, so he can't. And, like, when he, and he, like, finds time to, like, uh, and he has, like, the game sense to, like, be able to spend his time more efficiently, I think. There are a lot of players. It it like shows in his play, and he found like certain edges that like uh, other players couldn't replicate as well, mm-hmm. which which was like really impressive. Like I was in it, some of his lobbies, and I was just like, "Wow, that's some good that's some good play." God, I'm so sad that <laughs> like, the way the lobbies shook out, he was never in the marquee lobby, so we didn't follow him a lot. Mm-hmm. So we really didn't get to watch him until the final lobby. And his last game was like pain. I felt like a dagger to my heart as I'm watching him like completely fuck up this transition. He spent like 15 seconds popping his anvils when he should have been rolling and he died with like a billion gold. Um, Like it, it was tragic, but he clearly had something cooking over the course of this tournament because yeah, I mean, his his play was consistently good, and I agree. Like, some of the spots and the boards it felt like he got to at the end, the in-game screenshots and stuff were cool. Um, so I'm sad we didn't get to watch more of Sox at his peak, because it's been a while, frankly, since I saw Sox at his peak. And uh, there's there's very few things I love more than watching peak Sox play TFT. It's so, so fun. Because he, he does, he plays, he thinks about the game differently than, than most people do. Um, any, anyone else have thoughts on Sox before we move on? Pocky, Greya. A player that if if you want to take credit from 50 years ago (laughs) as well, you did put him on your power rankings when you were on the team fight talk show with Doa and Dan, like in set, I don't even know what set it was. It was like set three or four. Uh, That's the earliest known record of Greya being talked about. (laughs) Uh, He got there. He got there. He topped in this event. What happened? What makes Greya a special player? Uh, I mean, I I could take credit since I... Made that tweet. There we go. Recently, the W yeah. Glaze tweet. Yep, you did. So, I think he just has such strong fundamentals. It's like this sub level. Okay. I, I, sometimes I can't tell if Setsuko is like as strong fundamentals as this. It's it's a little hard to tell. He's like his play style is so weird to me. Yep. But Rhea feels like 
uh, this soap kind of like it is very like optimized for like this average placement kind of play style that I think a lot of players really just can't replicate because it's like I don't know their brains are like wired to differently or something and whenever I review with Greya we usually have very differing opinions on the game which ends up helping in my opinion it helps me a lot so it's like I, I can't exactly like say what he's like special at I do think his biggest flaw with PFT is his mental it's a little weak okay uh-huh and uh yeah he complains a lot like in dms and stuff but <laughs> <laughs> he's like taking bad beats and games of tft and he's getting getting in the dms afterwards to yap about it yeah he does oh god this guy is so fucked i'm never ranking this dude that is <laughs> that is a bad sign pocky <laughs> no he is so good he's so good man imagine and how he... good he would be if he if he didn't do that yeah, but it's like we we were doing a lot of uh, bot review with like like the Asa socks, uh, was it Spencer Gubums group, and I also got him to do bot reviews with like Tlaids, Riri, and like Curl. Yeah, so okay. getting a lot of uh, viewpoints. I think he he had a good read on the on the patch. And I wouldn't be surprised if he has a good read throughout the whole set. Interesting. He seems to be smurfing on ladder. Cool. Well, that'll that'll be really interesting to follow. That's another. That's another. We've got a bunch of this cup. If the if there's an overall story of this cup, it's the uh, the kind of names to look out for moving forward, right? Like aside from dish soap, like we talked about, a lot of the established names went down early, so it's kind of like the early flags planted um, for set eleven. It'll be interesting to see who keeps up with it. Uh, Philip, someone left on the list that, that we haven't talked about yet that you want to talk about. Who who's interesting to you? Who did you who did you like follow's performance? Uh I think like like Malala um is still like a beast. I don't think there's much to be like said there. Um other than like uh yeah, I mean he's still like capable of performing on like a hella high level, like talking down at water view. Um a lot of the times like I had like questions about spots that like he just like was like absolutely like oh like of course he's doing this like he, like you know he's playing for like this out or he's playing into this line, um and like yeah I mean that guy's such a beast and then like uh T lads can be really, I did bot review with both of them, um learned a lot from both of them I mean I think like I've talked about this before with T lads but just like such a good like uh early game player like knows knows like exactly like how long to hold like all of his outs I think that really influenced my play on uh like the final day um where I I like didn't end up like loose streaking. Um, very much where like I was sort of just holding like all of, like my story outs or like you know like even like faded or whatever, um and like uh, managing to like put together like strong mid game boards because of that, um and then like yeah I think like Bum Bum is a beast too I don't know I feel like people don't really like talk about him but like I feel like that guy's a hell of a good ladder player um super good at like, like capping out his board yeah cool um we really intentionally skipped over the players from other regions. We're still in this middle ground where we're, we're, we're saying we're the mm -hmm. kind of home of all things high level in the Americas. And that's very much the intention. And we're starting to incorporate, like we included the Latin and, and BR players and um, in the fantasy draft, for example. And I think ultimately we're going to want to include them in our rankings. We just want to give people some time to play with them and get used to them uh, and get a sense of their performance uh, before we start to actually like evaluate their play. Um, yeah. With with that said, overall some really strong performances. Altanakwe was right there. It was gonna, it was neck and neck going in that final lobby. It easily could have been him over Philip. Um, Babzera wasn't in contention at the end, but had the highest overall points in the tournament by three. Actually, had 112 mm -hmm. overall points, so the most consistent start to start to finish performer. Relic is a is one was one of the known commodities going in. Right, uh, absolute monster. And Altanakwe was too, by the way. Like I asked. Yeah. Um, some of the people at the top, a lot of the best, best performers from these regions, like if they picked their top five going in, like their tier one, a lot of these guys sh really showed up. Relic being one of them. VCLF like finishes 19th, you know, mm -hmm. right there. Also one of them. I see Toma uh, is Aussie one of those Toma, as well, actually. Well, yeah, Aussie yes. Toma's, mm -hmm. Aussie Toma's one of those as well, right? So a lot of the best, best players in Latin and BR yeah. showed up and proved that they can hang this weekend. I actually just recently did a VOD review with Isotoma and oh, VCLF, Greya yeah. as well. 
what did you it was like how did, how did that go was it after the tournament was it, uh it was yesterday okay, we just what, kind of what was planned it, like? it it was it was pretty cool i feel like uh there's stuff that i definitely learned from them and then it's like we we're just kind of like exchanging our opinions it it felt very much just like very high level players okay. discussing the game not not really any different from like reviewing with my usual did you reach people. out to them or did they reach out to you uh they reached out to me because of that tweet i made about like haha <laughs> eight of the 60 people i reviewed with <laughs> but like <laughs> but like technically there's like six people who could kind of say something similar because we all ended up reviewing with each other that's amazing I yeah, so it. they ended up reaching out to me. Okay, well, cool. That I'm glad you did that. I'm excited to see more of that come together over the course of the yeah. set and in set's future, right? There's a lot of really great players down there. I think overall, it's very clear that like the tier two, three, four, et cetera of North America is on a tour like much, much better than the lower tiers for mm -hmm. BR and Latam. But anyone who doesn't think that their best players are capable of like competing or not paying attention because they have been at Worlds. Uh, and when you like a bunch of them play on the North American ladder and so we get exposure to these guys and, um, you know, overall, it's just like really clear that, that they're capable of playing some really good TFT. So I'm excited to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's move forward. We're on to the agree. Oh, no, section. we got to, oh, no, wait, we're balance. recapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. We got to speed run this like part that. though. If we want to get to agrees, I, I believe in us, we can do it. So overall we oh, sucked. Yeah. There were four people Damn. in the top 15 who made it. Uh, it was This is a bloodbath. This is definitely one of the weaker that I can ever remember in the history of the show. But that's okay, because not everyone sucked who had the best ballot. Oh, I'll right. let you know who had the best ballot. It was me! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> what a time to be alive. We did not know this, by the way. Holy. We invited him before his ballot. We invited the guy that ranked Solus number one overall at one point. So Believers. You know, uh, questionable. Rise yeah. up! Uh, what? Kingley, why were you so good? Do you think it was this beat that you had on, like, backing performance from the yeah, set? So, so, first off, I'm not going to pretend like I actually have a better read on, on who's good, right? But I, I am going to say that, like, I, I mentioned this before. I had a clear framework for how I wanted to make my ballot, right? There are the, the, the known quantities that you're always putting on there. Um, and then I knew that I really wanted to value players who I felt were doing really well this set or were showing up in scrims uh, and or or doing very well in their last 10 to 15 games when I made the ballot. So I had this big list of probably uh, everywhere from like nine to maybe 25 to 30 of a ton of players that I wanted to throw into my ballot. And, and in order to fit players like Philip and JD and Asa and Sox and T Lides, the only way to fit them was by dropping players like Kurum and Robin, which I've never not ranked Robin. That was a that was probably the the hardest concession for me personally, uh, especially because this framework that I had was I I want to value the performers, right? Like if there's the three metrics of of skill, knowledge, and performance, I wanted to value performance more than anything else. And so to not put Robin on the list. What when I'm I'm trying to prioritize this like performance factor was really hard, but I really wanted to give a nod to players like Philip and JD uh, who had these really good runs. And Asa, I kind of felt like Asa was due. I know he didn't get top sixteen, but he made final day, and yeah, uh, yeah he, was right he was I think twentieth place overall. So I definitely got a little bit lucky, but uh, it was cool to kind of make the concessions of of not ranking the players who have historically been amazing and. Uh, my my ten through fifteen, these players did not let me down. They uh, they really showed up. So, yeah, it was beast mode. You had twice as many people as the overall ballot. And as an aside, I'm pretty sure Ace is back. I'm pretty sure I'm going to rank Asa from now on. Mm -hmm. He's just giving off the energy that he's back. I mean, we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll talk to him about it at some point. But uh, yeah, all right. Well, while we're taking victory laps, Gangly, let's take one more one more quick victory victory lap for the co-host lane. This fantasy draft, yeah. you don't need to see the score, guys, because I dominated. It wasn't, it even was close. It wasn't even <laughs> close. It was fucking Jover from the very beginning. Um, and even the players of mine that, like, flamed out, like, I mean, okay, like, replay busted day one. Like, it's going to happen sometimes. But, like, I mean, you know, 
was it was replay. It's fine, right? Uh, VCLF was right there for the top sixteen as well. Uh, I so, was yeah, was, was anyone good. surprised that Bryce won fantasy? Because I feel like if you looked at the teams, it was. I mean, I yeah. I also thought Dan Dan's team was also good. Dan, I I like my team mm-hmm. better because I like Pocky and just so yeah. Awesome. I told Bryce the one pick that that Dan had that I personally was not valuing as high was was Prestevin at the time. I think that you could have gotten a tier mm-hmm. one Latin American or Brazilian player for the same or just significantly cheaper than than Prestevin. But I thought Dan's team was really good. He had a bad beat with Michael having an early exit. But Bryce's team yep. was mm-hmm. insane in fantasy this time around. Yep. So, yeah, congrats to Bryce. By the way, team. I'm on a little bit of a hot streak in fantasy. A lot of people gave me a lot of <laughs> shit for a long time when I was struggling. I wasn't watching TFT. I had just had two babies. Okay, but I'm back. Hot streak incoming. <laughs> All right, time for agree. You want to do it? Let's do it. We got agree. Number one, Brazil and Latin America proved this weekend that they are not dramatically weaker than NA, I think that's what to say, has thought them to be. Yeah. Uh, Pocky, why don't you start us off on this one? Uh, I've always been of the opinion that like the top end of every region is more or less the same-ish level. And I think they definitely showed that this weekend. Uh, like, maybe you could argue, that, like, once you go a little bit down, like, I feel like top 50 of NA, there are a lot of competent players there. And that might not be as true for the other regions. But that kind of, like, is natural with how much competitions uh, so many people are allowed to be in. Yep. In NA. So is that an agree or disagree with the statement? It's probably, I would agree, mostly. Because I think, ultimately, when people think about regions, they're usually thinking about the top players. Like, or comparing regions. Philip, how about you? Oh, I would hard agree. Um, I like, uh, I, I think my opinion of the other regions actually rose a lot in, like, the, the last week, just from, like, you know, like water viewing their players playing against them. I think it's you, you, you less notice playing against them than you do from like going into like water reviews, right? But from like all the VODs and like the, the scrims I reviewed of um the BR and Latam players, uh, they were all like playing at like I thought like a very high level. They were taking like uh lines that like I hadn't thought of before, but like made a lot of sense once I like uh like watched them play out. Like I think like something like I'm a lot more open now is taking like um reinforcement and like dynamic duo on four two, which I like did a few times in tournament. Oh, and that's like not something I was really clicking at all before I saw like the um uh specifically like I was watching like Fritz do that a bunch, but I think it's uh a lot of like Latin players uh like sort of doing that, skipping eight going nine, or like, you know, slight rolling eight going nine, which like I thought just like made a lot of sense in the meta. So like little little like reads like that I thought were like uh very cool and like I didn't really expect to see. Cool. Gangly. So the field for for the weekend was it was seventy seven North uh, North Americans and then the you know the split with the rest was Latin and Brazil and Philip and I had talked about you know what was your what what was our expectation going into day three how many North Americans were going to make it and I for I think Philip originally had a really high number brought it down to like twenty seven or twenty six right and I think I had said twenty five like I don't yeah. remember what I said maybe like twenty two twenty three some, somewhere around there Damn. but. It was 20 North Americans in final day, right? And 12 Latin plus Brazil, which is pretty interesting if you consider that the expected number, if everyone is an equal chance, is 18. So it actually was only, and you know, the assumption obviously is that North America has a significant gap and that that number would be much higher. And so the amount of Latin American Brazilian players that made day three was much higher than I personally expected. So I, I would say... You know, like everyone else saying, agree asterisk. We can't forget what happened at the tacticians trials where the North American open players kind of rolled the field. Um, and we had, what was it like 44 players advanced from trials into the main event, but it was really impressive to see what the high end of these other regions brought to the, uh, to the event. Yeah. Uh, ult- I agree too. Ultimately, I think that this is kind of a badly phrased agree question. This is why Dan does this, not me. <laughs> um, because the reality is it depends on which part of the region you're talking about. The top end is clearly belongs. It's, you know, the the lower end clearly weaker, but also the trials was like 
it's from my understanding the quality of sign up on both sides was just not comparable mm-hmm. right so if you actually have the comparable players from br and last am signing up it wouldn't be that bad i think na proved it's stronger as a whole and i would guess that the top end is probably slightly stronger too but i think the top end clearly hangs and i think these guys are only going to get better playing against us and like th- this is overall going to make the americas even stronger because putting more tier one players from these regions in is going to make our top end stronger too Everybody's going to push each other to get better. And I want to say optically, and just like I guess on a story level, it's really cool that the players that made final day from LATAM and Brazil were those top three, top four players. LATAM had their historical rankings that they released not too long ago. And and Altanawe obviously was number one. He is the the GOAT of LATAM, and he gets second in the event. Relic uh, is in that like current form, top three, trying to break into that historical three. But he's only been playing for like, seven months eight months something yeah a year yeah 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 it's crazy. and then i say toma uh is is has been to worlds before so like it, it's cool that you know tft is a game where it only takes one person to be good from your region because it is a solos game so i i, I think it's really cool that we were able to see these players with yeah. the brand already able to to um you know perform and, and continue to make a name for themselves agreed okay let's move on to the next one Set 11 balance is a clear step back from recent sets. Philip, we're going to start with you. Oh, I think I'm a bad person to ask about all of this because, like, I just, like, uh, I, I, I only remember, like, the last, like, two patches. Um, I, I have, like, no memory. But, like, uh, I mean, like, uh, <laughs> like, you don't remember the other sets that <laughs> you're saying? <laughs> It all it, it all kind of like blends together. I just like. But do you, I, do you I, have a feeling about it? Like you surely you must have like a oh I va- like my sentiment of this set was. I think bad. it's like I don't is it like I I feel like it's like not that bad. I feel like people kind of like overstate how bad it is. I remember it used to be like hella bad. Like we would like need like B patches every 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 oh. patch, right? And like I mean, I guess that's kind of been happening now. But like I I feel like um. Oh, like, like, okay, I actually can't explain to you how much, like, brain rot I have. Like, whenever anybody <laughs> asks me what my favorite set is, I just say, like, the current one, because I don't, like, it's sort of hard for me to remember what happened in the last one. I just, like, oh, I play too much of the game, and, like, I, like, I don't have, like, the mental space to, like, reminisce, you know, but, like, oh. Philip, you're telling no, me, I mean, like, I... you're telling me that someone came to you, dragons are the game, and, and someone says, what's the best set of all time, and you're like, oh, this one, <laughs> this is the best set of all time. There was uh, no way you yeah, said that, man. Oh no, because I, I really liked I really liked Papio the set before, so like that, that's probably like an exception. Well, actually, no, because like I, I really like playing like a uh, wait. I think it like was at the time because like it's it's so hard for me to remember. But um, okay, like the, like I think it's overstated in set eleven because I think people are kind of like I, I feel like set eleven more than any like one I can recall. People are just like so obsessed with like these like three four like comps every every set, but they they like over contest them, right? Like the thing is like. I feel like Yone got over contested like last patch, like the set, the patch before, like maybe like Bard was like turbo over contested for like how broken it is. So I think like the balance issue is probably like a little overstated. Although I think like the the balance lies more in like the like it's not the comps specifically that are super broken, but it's sort of like the the nature of the comps, you know, where like four cost is super like broken right now because of like the the game changes. Um, where like before it's been like oh this like one unit is super broken, and, like everyone mm-hmm. needs them on their board. I know. Yep uh gangly yeah oh wait wait philip that's that's a disagree correct uh like it's a disagree but with the disclaimer that i don't remember recent okay. so like, all yes. right no, dis- no disclaimers on the scoreboard philip <laughs> disagrees with this statement i think um when you're comparing to set 10 it's it's it definitely feels like a step back um i think set 10 because we had like such a we had a lively variety of different ways you could play the game. You could play for like a 3-2 roll down. You could you could stabilize your board on a, a myriad of parts of the game. That and what Philip said, I just want to plus one and I'll keep my my take pretty short, is that I really dislike how every patch feels like it's not necessarily changing the meta of like compositions that are viable, but it's changing the framework of like how you have to play the game. And I really dislike that. For, I feel like the best metric of how healthy the meta is, is if you're able to stabilize your board on 3-2 and not feel like you're making the wrong decision for rolling on 3-2. I, I, I really hate how, like, it's either a re-roll meta or it's a four-cost meta, and it's not allowing you to have the room for both. 
So you also I agree. You agree. Okay. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Uh I think I disagree I think I agree. Oh, actually I think I agree with the statement. Yeah, I agree with the statement. I, I think it is a step back. I agree with everything you guys have said, so we need to belabor the point. Stylistic flexibility. The, I some at some point in time I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna write my opinion on what is a perfect TFT meta. Because I think a lot of the time when I listen to Mort and other people who design TFT talk about like what is a balanced state, I think that they speak to certain elements of what I consider to be a balanced state in TFT, but not all of them. And I think stylistic flexibility is a really good example of something that doesn't get talked about a ton. Um, and I think that this this set has been this great example because... Yeah, I did not love the last two patches. They were like overly reroll centric to me and a little too degen. It was just not the way I want to play the game. But the whiplash of going from that to this um, shows that like TFT, it, it's taking away a huge part of what makes TFT fun, which is that you can like play a lot of different styles. And one day, one game you roll and you're rerolling one cost or two cost, three cost. Sometimes you're hard stuck on eight playing around four cost. Sometimes you're able to get to nine or 10 and like really cap out your board. Uh, and I like that variety to my TFT, and we basically haven't had that variety the whole set. Well, I guess I oh. need to say my opinion. Yeah, please. I would disagree. Okay. And I think, uh, personally, I'm of the opinion that a lot of people end up looking back on sets and, like, pretending it was one thing, and it really wasn't when you actually look through all of the sets like personally i have so many complaints on every set and like as a result personally what i like from a set is if it's more complex which is a big part of why i like set five it was more complex and then it's also but i i do recognize that like a lot of people don't and then there's a big whiplash using same word as you did from Going from a set that has chosen and headliners to a set that doesn't. Yep. The the way that you have to play is so different. And I think a lot of people don't like that change. And it, it kind of affects how they perceive this set. I don't I don't think like the previous uh well I would say so fourteen point eight was like not that bad outside of like this three star four cost but a lot of times in the higher level uh, lobbies you end up seeing people scout actively enough to prevent that kind of stuff from happening super regularly and then like the patch before i don't even think it was bad i actually think like the way that uh the three costs played out was a lot more interesting than just, oh, we're just pressing D. Mm -hmm. Because there was really a lot more to the decision-making when playing those comps. Especially since a lot of those comps ended up being contested. So, in my opinion, I, it's a disagree. I think every set more or less sucks in some ways and doesn't suck in other <laughs> ways. <laughs> Dan would I like you it. to just say out loud that other people are bad at TFT. <laughs> basically okay we got it basically he's on the record <laughs> all right uh moving right along what is next gangly submitted this one open bracket players should be considered just as strong as ladder qualified players at future cups gangly this is your submit buddy let's have you take the so i th I, this is like I, I think you can interpret this question a couple different ways that makes it more absurd uh, but like I think if you take this question in good faith it's it is really worth looking at so first off the fact that snapshots have been cut from 32 to 23 is a huge factor in recognizing the strength in open bracket players for this set. The fact that Wajin Iverson, Casper Wu, and Philip were three of the four highest scoring players at the trials was not an accident. I think that if you take a look at future cups, you would you would be surprised how many players that, that qualify through the trials are going to be those players that make it into the, the final day. I mean, off the top of my head, and I wish I had done my homework to like actually get a hard number, but I mean, Philip obviously wins a tournament coming through open bracket, triple eight makes top eight also coming through the open bracket. 
I believe all of the Latin American and Brazilian players were all qualified in, but I, and I wish I had the actual number, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we continue to see one or two open bracket qualified player in the top eight of, of the next cup. I think that if you take a look at like the tip of, of the trials for every uh, for, for every trials that we have, you're going to see the best performing players in trials consistently perform in, in future cups. And for that reason, I agree. Okay. I think I'm going to disagree with this statement. I definitely hear where you're coming from. I'm not sure it's really fair to put like Wajian Iverson as an open bracket player because he like misjudged his snapshot cutoff. It's going to happen. There's usually going to be at least like one random elite player that winds up playing um, in the opening weekend, especially since you're right, since they've reduced it. But the reality is that I think the gap between like the top and it depends on any given meta, but like the top 12 to 20 players and everyone else is oftentimes pretty insane, actually, in terms of just like their fundamentals being so much sharper, their play being more complete and more consistent. So I think it's not fair to say that they should be considered just as strong kind of viewed holistically though obviously in any given event someone can run well or play well a lot of those a lot of the open bracket players have the potential to play at an elite level but don't do it consistently whether it's because they're not in form or they're not locked in on the day or some other mental disruption who knows right so i I agree with the i agree with your argument that like we're going to see someone in the top eight usually from the open bracket but i don't agree with the statement uh pocky you're up i would Mm, agree i think especially since they reduced the amount of slots it kind of exacerbates the difference in the strength because i think you can like confidently say uh like roughly speaking like i would say like the top 15 are like a typically much better than like the top 50 i think there's a lot of players who are like competent and like if they have a good free patch or whatnot, they are able to perform, especially like of the NA players. But like, there's still a difference. It's like substantial enough that I wouldn't really consider it like all the open bracket players because then that extends really far down. I think it ends up being like very much so that the ladder qualified will be on average quite a bit stronger. Okay. Philip, bring us home. Yeah, I would um disagree. Um I, I mean I think there's uh, I think there's like no real difference in like skill between like the twenty third and twenty fourth best player or like highest ranked player on ladder, right? Even though that's like the arbitrary cutoff we use for like a qualification. So I think like that's fine. But like um I don't like I mean just, just having played the first weekend, um, like I, I scored a lot of points, but I don't really think I like played particularly well honestly um like i don't think you have to play that particularly well i think like the form i was in then is also the form i went like a dead like eighth in scrims with um where it's basically just like do whatever and hill four two you can roll for like any any like you know four cost front line whatever like back line stabilize and you just like win the game like who cares um so like i i like i the the i'd say like the lobbies are like very weak and i don't think the the strengths that you need to get out of like a Day three are necessarily the strengths you need to like uh win a tournament. Um, although obviously like there's some people who will have both, and like a lot of those people are people that'll be like um close to qualifying uh in ladder. If that makes sense, makes perfect sense. Okay, that was a good one, Nick. We two agrees, two disagrees. Okay, so time to start bringing this thing in for a landing. I think we have an announcement. That's right. Because before we land. Buckle your seatbelt because we got a wild ride happening next week. So um, I think so, a lot of people probably know about this event. But if you don't already, we are doing the first of its kind 8v8 Tri-State versus Toronto crew battle in TFT. So this is how it works. We have eight players from Tri-State, uh, four of which were invited, four of which who qualified in through. through we have an online qualifier and then an, in, a LAN LCQ, and then same thing. Uh, Toronto had four invited players and then four 
qualified players. The, the rosters, as they are right now on the Tri-State side, we have Re-Replay, Void Sin, the two players on this podcast right now, Philip and Pocky, and then the four invited players from Toronto are Kiyun, Wajin Iverson, Weird, Pitsy. Last night, both uh, both regions had their online qualifier. We had three players come in, Bet, 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 Jason the Asian, and a name that I think many pa- people will be surprised to see, it's Harrison, but you may know him better as Chess Mage, the man from Set 4 Regionals, one of the old school heads of TFT, comes out of the woodwork, a mobile player now, decides to show up on PC. (laughs) No, he's a mobile player. He shows up on PC for one tournament and just goes second place, qualifies into the land. Uh, On the Toronto side, though, they actually had two lab members, Brosef and Maki, and then Upset Max. I don't know the other person, IMJHZ. They, they kind of had some, like, heavy hitters qualify in. And on the Tri-State side, I think people were very surprised that, like, Juku and Bosso and Invective and... Yeah. Uh, uh, there, there was a long list of players that would have... Whale, Whale of Peace, Peace Cool Guy Dom. Cool like, there's a lot of challenger players that just flamed out in the tournament. But we have... Uh, we've got our three, and you know what? I believe in them. So, the thing I, I want to just call out about this, though, is that... There are two simultaneous lands happening on May 11th. So if you are from Tri-State, you can go to Brooklyn. We're having a big event at Brooklyn in NYC. And then if you're in Toronto, they're hosting their own in-person event. So it's available for spectators where you can go hang out with all the players. We'll have a rotating couch at the Tri-State land where you can just kind of like co-stream with us. We'll rotate people in and out. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll be playing six games with uh, two game finals where the top scorers from each region will go head to head in in one final lobby. Man, that's sick. I'm sad I'm not going to be there. I definitely got to make it out for one of these. Uh, It's going to be too fun. Tri-State, you guys want to talk your shit now? You guys going to bring this thing home? We have the worst people. I I mean, I think... (laughs) (laughs) It's like I'm friends with all these people. Me too, but I got, yeah, Toronto, like, Toronto sucks. So, I mean, what, what did they bring? They brought in, like, Weird doesn't play the game right now. That guy's, like, finals jailed. Um, they brought in, like, three lab members. I mean, like, I, I won't say anymore. Uh, <laughs> Let's go. That's enough. That's I would say it's, uh, hey, it's, Phil, it's, Phil. it's hard to know the form of the Toronto players because they all got day one, you know? So. Ow. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that is, this guy is fucking poking the bear on that one. I don't know that I would have gone there <laughs> as a non as a non participant, giving some <laughs> locker room our shit material to the Toronto. I'm just the cheerleader. <laughs> that's that's my role here. Uh, I love it. Resident tournament organizer slash tri state hype man, Gangly. Yeah, Harrison already told me he's out here to grief the Toronto players. <laughs> oh, nice. We have this is like you know it's whenever you have the team event. I remember back in set four there was that four v four event where every team had their one Aphelios player. Like you have to just play Aphelios. That's uh, every team is going to have like one griefer where your only role is to grief mm-hmm. four players in the lobby at once. You sacrifice, you go eighth, but you you, you bring everyone else down with you. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, it's it's really hard. It's going to be really hard for Brosef and Upset Max to figure out that they're not supposed to grief three players in the game. Like I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure just just because of that we're making it out. Cheers. <laughs> I, I will say, um, you know, it's it's really cool. And shout out to Tristan and the whole Toronto crew for organizing this on their side. My my hope, and this is, I know, Tristan's hope as well, is that it doesn't end with just Tri-State and Toronto. There's a lot mm-hmm. of regions oh, in, yeah. in North America that have not been explored, like on the local scene. I know, Bryce, you and Dan have talked about trying to organize some stuff in the Pacific Northwest at some point in time. And I can't remember exactly who's in the... We got to convince New Bow to start playing yeah, TFT yeah. again. That I know for sure. Yeah. I know... You guys got Beppo. Beppo, yeah, Beppo, <laughs> yeah, Bowel, yeah. Bryce, and Dan. That's their four. I'm, I'm so down for it. That's the squad. At some point, I know uh, when we announced this, the there were a bunch of people from California. I know Asa was really excited. By oh it. yeah, he was like, California would clear. We can, uh, we want to play the winner. And I just want to say to California, maybe you can play the loser, but you got to work your way up. You know, we, you you don't just get a shot at the king. I think. Uh, wow. I. I wouldn't California just immediately be the favorites, by the way? Like, I think if the tri-state players can actually qualify for their own event, then we would be the best region in the, in North America. Do you do you lump together, like, Dish Lips, North Carolina, that, right? Yeah. That... So do you put, like, North Carolina with Maryland and do, like, a, that part of the East Coast? You, yeah, I mean, I feel like North Carolina is, like, kind of 
it's it's kind of an awkward spot, right? Because normally Maryland it is, is like an awkward Maryland, spot. Virginia, how, do you, how do they group? Delaware. Yeah, exactly. How I do don't know because is it is it like is it considered the South? North Carolina, is it? Uh, you can move. Yeah, we'll, well sign them. It, you know what's you know what's funny. <laughs> That's North when Carolina. you know we're getting. Wait, wait, I didn't even tell this story. So we had our and, and Bryce, you can tell me to show up if we're trying to wrap up. We we had no, our no, please, we good, had our good. qualifier last <laughs> night, right? And we had a bunch of people drop out last second because it's a tournament, right? It's natural, and so we get people from our wait list and we run out of wait list so then we're just kind of opening it up and some people come in and we're not really vetting everyone all that strictly because it's just like last minute we need people in yeah. game one ends and i get a message on discord from from Sayun kim if anyone knows him he's like 1100 lp mm-hmm. and he's like um i'm from toronto i think i'm in the wrong <laughs> tournament <laughs> <laughs> he just entered the wrong event and he, That's so, so he, he played out the first three games and then just dq'd himself so we had all 32 oh my gosh crazy that's stuff amazing. uh that's so good man yeah I, I i think building the regional rivalry would be really fun uh so i like that you guys are getting this started i'm excited to see where it goes from here because i think we can do a lot more of this for sure agreed agreed Okay, so one last thing, right, yep. to bring it home. I'm not I'm not messing up your own show. All right, it's appreciation time. Dan is on a 45-episode win streak in Don't Talk If You Don't Know. He has never missed an episode before. He hard carries this show like he hard carries this fucking community, quite frankly. The number of hats this guy puts on for TFT is bananas. Uh, he is insane how much. And, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize fully where this energy comes from. It's not just that Dan is great at all things and he puts he pours his whole self into stuff. It's also, you know, for those of you who aren't, who aren't aware of kind of Dan's backstory, he was he was in a similar position in relation to Hearthstone much early. You know, he's much younger and, and, and was a huge part as broadcast talent, as the growth yeah. of Hearthstone all the way through when it started to be on the decline a little bit. And I think he's... You know, more of a veteran now. He's got some wisdom, and I think he really sees this as an opportunity to kind of run it back. What would he have done heart- differently in Hearthstone if he had, if he knew everything he knew now? And we're getting that version of Dan. He was already so naturally talented and already such a hard worker, but we're getting this kind of this wisdom into everything that he does, and he's building it out slowly. He's got like an empire in, in the back of his mind of where all of this goes. He's thinking so many moves ahead, and he's just really kind of in the early to middle stages of his journey. Um, so I just felt like it was a good time to celebrate him. He's getting a break from this show for the first time in the history of the show. He's getting ready to have a kid. Uh, and I think we should all just say thank you to Dan for everything that he has done for all of us. Uh, and, and miss as many shows as you need to, buddy. The, sh- the podcast is going to be uh, be here when you get back. And as great as Nick is, and Nick is great, there's only there's one, one Dan. Dan. Uh, and Nick and I are trying to combine yeah. ourselves and to create 0.5 Dan while you're gone. But uh, the show isn't the same without you, buddy. We miss you, and we hope everything goes well with the kit. Um, so thank you for everything. Yeah. And with that, yeah, we have a show. If anyone wants to say nice things about Dan, I'm never yeah, going to stop. I, 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 I really, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I don't want. I, I think everything you said sums up everybody's thoughts on Dan. But I, I just want to say mm-hmm. when I was first starting really pumping out content in TFT back at like set four, set five. I think the turning point for me where I really felt like I had a vote of confidence from inside the community was when Frodan responded to my DM about getting an interview with, with him and was like, Hey man, this is awesome. Let's just do it. And he hopped in a call with me. Uh, we talked for like, I think 30 minutes or so. And, and it, he, he just had such like a humble attitude uh, approaching someone who was really new to the scene. And I think, he was 100% one of the, 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 the core catalysts for my involvement in the scene. And I do not think that I would have the confidence to start doing the broadcast stuff that I did in the last few sets if it weren't that vote of confidence from Frodan, who who said directly to me, like, hey, man, you should be trying harder to do this because I think you can do it. And that, that that's something that not very many people in his positions would take the time to do. And, and for anyone who, I mean, we all appreciate Dan. We all love love Dan, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take the time to just say how much we do because our Agreed. scene would not be what it is today without someone like Dan. We wouldn't have the characters and the the stories that we have in our scene without Dan. So, yeah. For me, the Mount Rushmore TFT is more dog, soju, yeah. and Dan. And I think that all three of them in their own ways have had profound 
impact on the scene, the esport, the game itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Philip Propocki, yeah. you guys are more than welcome to weigh in on this if you want, but no pressure. Yeah, I mean, I, you guys are yeah. experts. <laughs> I, I can't picture um, TFT esports or it's like TFT without Fred Ann. Um, I mean, like, he's such a legend, and the, you know, the passion and enthusiasm he brings to TFT is like every day, every set is unmatched and you know i feel like it improves like the game and it improves the scene and it improves everyone in it and um yeah i mean massive shout out to him i i mean we as an esport are so lucky to have him agreed, agreed. all right that's our show a fun note to end on uh someone who can never get too many roses is dan uh, and he'll be back soon. And, and you know, we've got actually a 50th episode coming up where Dan and I are going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do something just the two of us, no guests for the first time and kind of reminisce about all this. So we'll get into a lot more of the kind of origin story and all the different things Dan has done in TFT than I'm sure. Um, but we're past time. Thank you guys so much for joining. Pocky, man, always a pleasure. Um, mm-hmm. Really, really enjoy talking to you about TFT, which we get on, have you on every, every episode. Any final words, shout outs, anything like that? Uh... There's probably going to be an announcement soon of a thing. Oh, this uh-huh. is the customary esports announcement of an announcement. I like it. Yeah. So I'm kind of excited with that. That's awesome. When 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 should we be looking out for this announcement of a thing? I actually have no idea. <laughs> I, I didn't. It is going to be an announcement. I have announcement. no idea what it is. But, uh, but it's I love happen. it. Some point in the future. Good things are going to happen, just like Gangless prediction nice. of triple eights. Uh, Philip, uh, you you talk some good shit. We got you there. I I appreciated it. Uh, it was great to have you on, man. I I missed you the first time. I wasn't I wasn't around. It must have been like Shay on you know my initial paternity leave, or whatever. But really enjoyed talking to you, and glad you're doing so well. Any uh any final words from you? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I just want to shout out like my study group. Um, I mean like I, I you know I'd still probably be like the the same shit player I was like getting to one every <laughs> tournament, if not for them. So like, uh, just eternally grateful for them and, you know, everybody else I've met through TFT. It's been, you know, just an absolute pleasure. Love it. Well, you'll be back. Keep it up, buddy. Uh, gangly man. Did we it. did it. It, it was not, I don't think it was bumpy. I think we did. Okay. I mean, not like Dan good, but we did. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. most importantly, I just had fun. I always have fun hanging out with you talking about TFT dude. Um, so thanks so much for stepping in and doing this. We might get to do more of them. We'll see. Chat, we have no idea when Dan's coming back. So this might be a one-time performance where it might be multiple. Maybe we'll get gang leader on a fantasy draft. One time. Uh, so any any final thoughts no, for you? No, nothing really. Just thank you to everybody. Um, check out the Tri-State event. You can find it on my Twitter. Join our Discord there. Uh, we really want to get people in the door. So that's, that's all I have to shout out. Thank you for, for having me on, Bryce. Hopefully not the last time. Yeah, maybe I can get into a fantasy draft at some point in the future. Yeah, I hope it's not the last time, too. Although, Dan, come back whenever you're ready. <laughs> we need you. That's it. Uh, I, I I forgot to write down the ending of the show. Dan has an ending he uses every time I got the opening. <laughs> Just say the, the opening ending, again. So I'm fumbling. I'm fumbling at the finish line. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This has been another episode of Don't Talk If You Don't Know. Uh, our next episode will be the week before the next cup, which is in a few weeks. Uh, much love. Good luck. Uh, happy climbing, everybody. Take care.